Hello everyone. In this video, we will be discussing our third value theorem of the semester, and that is the mean value theorem. So first I want to talk about just kind of the basic idea and draw some pictures that gives us some intuition for the mean value theorem, which we will usually call the MVT for short. So the main idea here is that the average slope over an interval is going to be equal to your instantaneous slope somewhere along that interval. So let's look at some pictures. All right, so we've got these two graphs here. And so this red line that I'm going to draw is going to represent the average slope or average rate of change, right? This secant line. So you know, this value up here is f of b, this is f of a. And so your average slope is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. We know how to do slopes of secant lines. And I'll draw the same line over here. So we've got that secant line. And then my point is there's somewhere inside this interval from A to B, at least one place, where you're going to have the same slope as the slope of this secant line. So your slope of a tangent line will equal the slope of the secant line. So in the graph on the left, we actually have two such points. And the graph on the right, we only have one where we see these lines parallel. Right? And so this is your instantaneous slope or instantaneous rate of change. And so the mean value theorem basically says that this will always happen, that there will be some point on your graph along this interval where the average slope is equal to uh, the instantaneous slope. But we will have some restrictions to make sure that this is true. It doesn't work for all functions. And then your like real world application, what, what is this really saying? So let's take an example of we're driving in a car, and so if I average 60 miles per hour, my average rate of change, my average velocity is 60 miles per hour over an entire trip, then the mean value theorem says that at some point, at some exact second on my trip, my speedometer must have read 60 miles per hour. There's no way that I could have like skipped over uh, 60 and still average 60 throughout. All right, so now that we have like the, the basic idea, we've seen the picture and a real world example, we're ready to actually give the formal statement of the theorem. So the statement is if f is continuous on a closed interval, so same as the extreme and intermediate value theorems, but we have this additional condition and also differentiable on the open interval, basically we don't worry about differentiability at the endpoints, but on the open interval, then there's some point on your interval, so let's go back to one of these graphs, right? So we had A, we had B. So here, this F of B minus F of A over B minus A, again, this is like slope of secant line or your average rate of change. And then F prime of C, well, we already know derivatives, right? This is slope of tangent line. And so we're saying that our instantaneous rate of change, the slope of the tangent line is equal somewhere to the slope of the secant line. And so here, you know, it looks like it's roughly around this point, and so this would be our C. So we'll talk more about why those assumptions are necessary in class. We'll examine, you know, why continuity and differentiability are necessary. Um, but here, let's look at an example of a potential use. So this seems like a question where the answer would just be yes. It seems like, sure, we can make functions so that almost anything can happen. Um, but what are we really talking about here? So we're assuming f of 0 is 0 and that f of 1 is 1. And then is it possible to have such a function where it's differentiable? And we'll talk about why this implies continuity uh, in class. And so it would satisfy the conditions for the MVT. And can we have it so that it also has f prime at least 2 everywhere? So how does the MVT show up? Remember, so MVT applies here because we are differentiable and hence continuous. Um, and it seems like we've got our closed interval from 0 to 1 here. So we should have some C with F prime of C equal to F of 1 minus F of 0. A is 0, B is 1 over 1 minus 0. And in this case, that's just 1, right? Because F of 1, so it's 1 over 1. Well, f prime of c equals 1, but we have that f prime of x is greater than 2 always. So, no, this is impossible, right? It's got to be greater than 2, and 1 is definitely not greater than 2. And what should you be thinking there 
This is saying the slope is always at least two. That means you're, you're growing twice as fast, at least, uh, with your y in terms of your x. And so how is it possible to just go over one and up one? It's not, it has to be steeper, right? There's no way we could have hit that point. That's what's going on there. So let's look at another type of problem. So here we're given a function, uh, the natural log of x, and a closed interval from one to e, and we wanna find the c satisfying the conclusion of the mean value theorem, if it applies. Uh, so first of all, the MVT does apply again, right? So we know that the natural log of x has f prime of x equal to one over x, and this exists on the interval one to e, right? The only problem would be zero, and that's not in that interval. And so we're looking for the c that satisfies f prime of c is f of e minus f of one over one, or sorry, e minus one. Well, what would this mean? So we know what this right side is. f of e is ln of e minus ln of one over e minus one. ln of e is one. ln of one is zero over e minus one. And so we get one over e minus one. But we also know what f prime of c is. That's one over c. So we have one over c equals one over e minus one. So this says c is e minus one. And this does indeed lie in that interval. Okay. So for your first exercise, uh, I'm giving you this quadratic function and I want you to do the same thing that I just did, right? So find the C satisfying the conclusion of the mean value theorem on the closed interval from negative two to two. So the next thing we're gonna do is actually prove the mean value theorem. So the way we're gonna do that is actually first look at Rolle's theorem, which is a specific case of the mean value theorem, namely where your endpoints are the same value. So f of a equals f of b. So basically the same conditions, we just add this extra one, the f of a equals f of b. Then in this case, right, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, if f of b equals f of a, this is gonna be zero. And so our con uh, conclusion is there is a c in a b with f prime of c equal to zero because that's the average rate of change. So the picture here, right, is you have something like this maybe where again, we have uh, the same value at our endpoints and then somewhere we're going to have a horizontal tangent line uh, on the open interval inside. So why is this true? Right, why should we believe this besides looking at a picture and saying that this always works? So I wanna draw your attention to the fact that we still have continuous on a closed interval. So the extreme value theorem applies because we have that condition. And so if we know the extreme value theorem applies, then there must be a max and min on this closed interval. Okay, so we're gonna look at two cases. So case one is that the max is equal to the min. So what would that mean? Well, if your max and min values are the same, that means your function had to be the same throughout, right? It has to be a constant function. So this would mean that f of x is some constant, say, we'll call it k. Well, what do we know about derivatives of constant functions? It's always zero. So f prime of x equals zero for all x. And so in this case, right, our conclusion f prime of c equals zero works for all x in the interval. So you can choose your c to be anything there. So it would work. So then the other case is that your max and your min are not the same value. And so in this case, that would be like our first picture over here, right? Our max is up here and our min is down here. And so our max and min are not equal. And since our endpoints are equal, right? So since f of a equals f of b, uh, only one of the max or min could happen at the endpoints. It doesn't mean that one necessarily will, uh, but, right, because you could have something like this, for instance, you could go down, back up, and then back down. So the endpoints here would neither be a max nor a min, but like our picture up top, the max is the endpoints, but, you definitely can't have max and min at the endpoints if they're not equal. And so uh, only one can happen at endpoints. 
And if that's the case, then the other has to happen on the interior, right? It happens on the open interval. Well, we talked recently that if you have a max or min on the inside of an interval, then it's gotta happen at a critical point. And in this case, right, a critical point is where the derivative is zero or does not exist, but we know the derivative exists. So this happens at a critical point where f prime is zero. And that would be our, our c. Okay, so this is why Rolle's theorem is always true. And then it turns out that the mean value theorem just quickly follows. So here we've got our function f of x, and then I'm going to call this secant line l of x, you know, l for line. And so we'll define a new function g of x to be f of x minus l of x. So what's special about this? So if this is at a and this is at b, then the way we've defined this, we note that f of a is l of a and f of b is l of b, right? They meet at the endpoints. So this tells you that g of a is zero and g of b is zero because we're just subtracting equal values from each other. So Rolle's theorem is going to apply here, namely because a line is differentiable and continuous and our function is differentiable and continuous. And so uh, subtracting one from the other, still going to satisfy the hypotheses. And so Rolle's theorem applies to G. So this means there's some C in AB with G prime of C equal to zero. But what is G prime of C? G prime of C is F prime of C minus, well, we know what this line is. It's F of C, uh, or sorry, F of B minus F of A over B minus A. That's my slope of the secant line, right? And so I know this is equal to zero. And the last thing I do is just add over to the other side, right? So I get F prime of C is F of B minus F of A over B minus A. And this is exactly what I wanted. This is a conclusion of the MVT. So the last thing I wanna show you is how this can be used to show something as exactly one root. So to show this, we're gonna first show that there has to be a root and then that something would go wrong if we thought there were more than one. So uh, how do we show that there is one? Well, we've already done things like this, right? The IVT can tell us that. So here we would look for a sign change, right? So let's just plug in, uh, since f of zero is six, which is positive, I wanna look for something negative, since I have a cubic, that's gonna give me a negative thing. So uh, this would give me negative 27, so negative nine minus three plus six, which is negative six, that's less than zero, f of zero is six, which is greater than zero. And so we would conclude that there is some root in the interval from negative three to zero. So now we assume there's more than one root. So assume there is greater than or equal to two roots for this function, okay? So essentially I have this picture, right? It's a cubic, so maybe it looks something like this and I'll look at these two. You know, we'll just say they're A and B. In this case, we would have F of A equals F of B is zero. So Rolle's theorem applies, right? This is continuous, this is differentiable. And so Rolle's theorem applies because we have uh, same values at our endpoints. And this tells us there's some C in the middle with F prime of C equals zero, right? So there's some C in the interval from A to B with F prime of C equal to zero. But why is this bad? So let's look at F prime. So with our function up above, F prime of X is going to be x squared plus one. Can this ever be zero? No, right? This is never zero because x squared plus one is always at least one. And so we have a contradiction. And so because of that contradiction that we get if we have more than one root, this means that there is at most one root. So there is less than or equal to one root. The IVT said there is at least one root greater than or equal to one. And if you're less than or equal to one and greater than or equal to one, there must be exactly one. Okay. And for your second exercise, I want you to answer the following question. So is it possible for a differentiable function? Remember, this also means it's continuous. So MVT applies. 
to have three roots, so cross the x-axis three times, but only have one critical point. I highly recommend drawing a picture here and seeing you know, what you see going on, and I want you to explain your answer. Okay, thank you for watching.